for him. Yeah. Lucky guy off in Mexico. <laughs> so Tate, I hope you watch this one day because this one's for you. <laughs> and if he doesn't say something about this, I'll know he never watched this. Okay. Um, today's topic. Seriously, you didn't grab those yet? Everybody ready now? Sorry, Kate. Sorry, Kate. Right. Okay, um, today's topic is on trigonometric ratios. And this is probably, I see this a lot, I'm sure, but this is one of the most important units in trigonometry or topics in trigonometry because this is the information that actually leads into the the, the math 30-1 curriculum. And so I like to go really deep into the grade 11 side of this so that in theory, when you guys take the stuff in grade 12, we might have covered a little bit extra, if that makes sense. So I'm gonna add a few extra things into this topic that just so you guys know, really aren't grade 11 curriculum. I promise you, they're not hard, but I found in my experience, if I show you them now, then if you're familiar with the concept in grade 11, then when you have to use it in grade 12, you're like, oh, we did this a little bit last year. Does that make sense? So, um, okay, here's the concept. There are six known trigonometric ratios, and you guys know three of them, sine, cosine, and tan. Okay. And I'm thinking back in grade, I don't know, eight, you guys learned an acronym for them? Uh, SOCATOA. All right. When you were in grade eight, whenever you learned this for the first time, the truth is math teachers probably only taught you about half of it. They only showed you sine, cosine, and tan. But there are actually three other ratios you could solve for. So let me see that I can describe them to you. Sine is taking whatever the opposite length is and dividing by the hypotenuse. Well, what if rather than taking opposite over hypotenuse, what if we decided to do hypotenuse over opposite to flip it upside down? Well, then it's not called a sine anymore. It's a different ratio. So we have another name for it. We call that a cosecant. I know. It's kind of weird because you've never heard that term before in your life. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. Um, actually, why don't we make up some numbers here for this? Have you guys ever seen the three, four, five triangle? Where like one side is three, one side is four, the hypotenuse is five? If I were to ask you about sine, sine would be four over five, opposite over hypotenuse. Cosine would be three over five, adjacent over hypotenuse. And tan would be 4 over 3. Does that make sense? I just made up numbers. I just said, why don't we go with 3, 4, and 5 just to make some numbers there. In junior high, to make things simple, teachers only teach you sine, cosine, and tan. Because it trick is hard enough as it is. Let's keep it simple. Does that make sense? But the truth is, is what if you were to take those ratios, and rather than go 4 over 5, what if you were to go 5 over 4? And rather than 3 over 5, you do 5 over 3 and 3 over 4. Anybody ever done a trig problem before and like they accidentally screw it up and they do the numbers in the wrong spots? Okay. I mean, you've probably been there and you, you get the wrong answer or your calculator says error maybe sometimes. Okay. Well, the, these things actually have names. Okay. So cosecant is abbreviated as CSC. Secant is abbreviated as SEC. And cotan is abbreviated as COT. SEC -E -E is secant. CSC -E is cosecant. And cotangent is known as cotan. These things are reciprocals of each other. Do you guys remember what reciprocals are? Oh, yeah, to the negative one. Let me, let me show you something here. If I were to give you 4 over 5 to the negative 1, it actually means to flip the fraction upside down. And so it actually becomes 5 over 4. And like 3 over 5 to the negative 1 would become 5 over 3. Does that make sense at all here? If you have three sides and you have three angles in a triangle, you could go, let me see if I can write them all out here. If you had three sides and three angles in a triangle, so let's just call this, I don't know, A, B, and C. You could go A over B, but you could also do B over A. You could go A over C. 
but you could also do C over A. And then for the other relationship, you could go, what did I skip, B over C? But you could also do C over B. Okay. Well, in junior high, if I haven't made this point clear, we decided to basically like skip half of them, just to keep it simple. Does it make sense though that like junior high math is probably hard enough as it is? If you had to work with other trig ratios, that'd be kind of confusing. So we just kept it to the simple ones like sine, cosine, and tan. And that was enough to solve with for junior high problems. But in theory, we could then flip the ratio upside down. So my goal today is to help you get used to that concept because that's a huge concept in grade 12. Um, okay, so here are some formulas that, to be honest, if you guys don't have written down on a formula sheet somewhere, it may not hurt to put them down for you. Okay, so sine, this is very wordy by the way, sine is opposite over hypotenuse, like it always has been. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, like it's always been. Tan is opposite over adjacent, again, like it's always been. But here are the three new ones that I need you guys to know. Yeah. Go for it, yeah. In case you don't want to memorize it. <laughs> what happens if we didn't do opposite over hypotenuse, but you did hypotenuse over adjacent? Well, that is now called a secant. That's all. Just a new word for it. If I were to give you hypotenuse over opposite, that is known as a CSC. That's called a cosecant. And a adjacent over an opposite is known as a cotan. So these three ones right here are new. But they're really easy. All you do is you take your fraction and it upside down. Does that make sense? Let's all of this. I get this question a lot. And I think I do a fairly decent job of being able to answer it in most scenarios. The question is, where will I ever use this in life? I hope for the most part, throughout most of the year, you'd agree that I've tried to find these scenarios where, yeah, this matters to someone somewhere. For the life of me, I have never been able to really give a good answer for where a secant is useful. Okay? So just so you know, like, this is not very purposeful math, but we're also in pre-calculus stream which is designed to go towards university level calculus. And I promise you, a lot of that stuff is also not really all that purposeful. It's like math. Because we can do math, we try to do weird things. It's like math for the sake of doing math. And that's the best way I can describe secant, cosecant, and cotan. They're not necessarily more useful. They don't actually do anything better than anything else. It's just it's another way of writing it. Rather than going this guy divided by this guy, you could have flipped them upside down. <coughs> is it useful? Probably not. But what is, what Ah, there's a good question there. Your calculators don't actually have a button for this. So what you need to do is that if I ask you to do a, a secant or a cosecant or a cotan, you do the whole little negative one button and you flip it upside down, and then you use cosine tan or, or secant. Let me show you some examples in a bit, though. Okay. Um, more pictures, if that doesn't make enough sense here. Let's try an example here. Let's try to find the six trigonometric ratios for the following triangle. Uh, could you grab the door, Kristen? Okay. Um, based on this triangle here, we need to label the sides as opposite, adjacent, and hypotenuse. Which side's the hypotenuse? 11. Yeah, for sure the 11. And if this guy is the angle right here, the four is the adjacent, and we don't know the opposite. I can actually write one of my trig ratios, though. Actually, I can write two of them. I can tell you what cosine of theta is equal to. Cosine of theta is equal to adjacent over hypotenuse. And wouldn't you know it, but I know the adjacent, and I know the hypotenuse. So cosine is 4 over 11. I can actually write one more of these now. Uh, secant is what goes with cosine. And secant is hypotenuse over adjacent. So what's the ratio of a secant going to be? 
There you go. That's it. Eleven over four. It's not actually hard, to be honest. And that's the reason why I decided to throw this into grade 11 with you guys. Because it's not that hard. Just take whatever the fraction is, flip the other one upside down. But I found that if I can show you this in grade 11, grade 12 becomes a little easier because you're like, oh, I've seen that before. I get the concept. Does that make sense? OK, um, we could try to do something like, say, sine of theta. Sine of theta is opposite over hypotenuse. And I know my hypotenuse is 11, but I know my opposite. How can I find the opposite? Times up the but I don't know theta either then. Oh. Yet. Pythagoras' theorem will work well. Yeah. So Pythagoras' oh. theorem would say that 11 squared should equal 4 squared plus the opposite squared. How do you get opposite by itself then? All right, so that's 121 minus 16 square rooted is the opposite. Uh, what is that, 105? Uh, we haven't done this in a couple of days here, but 105, is that a number that you can actually like break it down into lower numbers? Um, to check, you need to divide by like perfect square numbers. So um, one of the perfect square numbers is 4, because that's 2 squared. Does 105 divide by 4? Uh, 9 is probably the next number to use because that's 3 squared. 16. 25. 36. You guys know where I'm getting these numbers from, right? Yeah, yeah. Not 36? <laughs> no, I was saying. Oh, okay. Um, what, 7 times 7, 49. Does it divide by 49? Right, I, think, I think we're done. So, unless this thing can get broken down simpler, we're just going to leave it as root 105. I thought that hypotenuse over adjacent was um, the other one, like C, S, C, or whatever. Well, that's the one we're going to do next. Because then when I do um, hypotenuse over opposite, that one's the C, S, C one. Do I have that backwards on the slide somewhere? <laughs> um, this one right here is the C, S, C one. This one is the S, E, C one. This one is the C, O, T one. Um, the way I remember them in my head is that sine and cosine, the only difference between them is that one of them has the word co in it. Sine, co, sine. These two are almost the exact same as each other as well. Only one is called the secant and one is called a co-secant. And the way it works is that if sine doesn't have the co on it, then its doppelganger does get the co on its own. That makes sense. Whereas then since cosine already has the word co on it, then its doppelganger does not get a co on it. Does that make sense? So like, since this one does not have a co, this one has to have a co. Since this one does have the co, this one over here does not get a co. And then since this one here does not have a co, then this one here does have a co. That's how I remember them. But if you have to write them down, that's fine too. My hope is, though, after like spending a few units of, use, of doing this in grade 11, when we get to grade 12 and you have to think about what's cotan, you'll be like, oh, wait, I know this. No. Rather than spending all of your time in grade 12 trying to be like, what the heck's a cotan? So it's still straight across like this. Yeah. So cosecant, then, is the opposite of a sine. And so for this guy, it would be 11 over root 105. So there's a problem there. Can I have square roots on the bottom of a fraction? Okay, now if you haven't figured this trick out by now, basically all you're doing is timesing by root 105 over root 105. So it means that the bottom is now 105, the 11 still stays there, and you just end up with a root 105 on top. Uh, does 11 actually divide into 105? Then we're good. We're done. I'm guessing it doesn't simplify, because 11 is prime. So 11 doesn't really divide by many things. Uh, I've skipped two of the ratios here. So if I've done the cosine and secant, and sine and cosine, the remaining one is tan. So tan is opposite over adjacent. So the opposite would be root 105. The adjacent would be 4. 
Well, we're just we're doubling it. You used to have to do sine, cosine, and tan. Now you just have to do three more. But like the three more aren't hard, are they? You just take the fraction and just flip it upside down. They are. Don't get me wrong. They are silly. If if I could find a useful purpose for it for a grade eleven math student, I'd love to. But I just I can't. But I hope you guys agree with why I'm doing this. Like it's it's not hard and it's worth the investment of just talking about them now. So. Uh, this guy also needs to do that whole um, get the square root off the bottom trick. So this guy is 4 root 105 over 105. That make sense? Yep. All right. Purpose behind this then. That seemed kind of silly, like we just wrote a whole bunch of numbers down. Normally though, the purpose of a question would be to find Theta. Like, wouldn't we like to find this theta answer right here? Well, now let's try doing that in our calculators. I'm going to prove it to you six different times how to find that theta value. One for each of these ratios. I just got to figure out how to get my calculator up on the screen here. So grab your calculator. This one doesn't run on batteries. So do we do that? Where do we do that? Um, I don't know. Find some more space. I'm actually just going to do it in my calculator just to prove it to you. Let's say you wanted to find this angle right here, and you were going to use cosine. And cosine was 4 over 11. Do you guys remember how to do like inverse cosine 4 over 11? The angle is apparently 68.676 degrees. Yeah. Okay, now Haley, you asked a question a while back that I kind of glossed over. What if I wanted to try using secant for this? Well, secant, there's no button in your calculator for secant, is there? So there is a different way of doing it. What you could do is inverse cosine the 11 over 4. Okay. But a, that, would, that would not work. Like if I try to do this, my calculator says I, I can't handle that. Does that make sense? So instead of doing that, before I do the 11 over 4, I'm just going to delete some stuff here. I need to do 11 over 4 to the minus 1. And what that's going to do is that's going to flip my cosine into a secant. You see how I get the same answer? So like your calculator physically cannot do a secant. But what you can do is do cosine and throw a little minus 1 in there, because the minus 1 flips the fraction upside down for you. Let me show you another example here. What if we tried doing it with sine? Well, sine, actually we need to inverse sine, what would it be, root 105 divided by 11? This should also give me the exact same answer. Whoa. Well, what if I didn't want to use sine though? What if I wanted to use cosecant? Well, my calculator does not have a cosecant button. So what I can do is try sine, type in what I thought sine was going to be. So sine, it was supposed to be what, 11 root 105 divided by 105? But then because my button doesn't, my calculator doesn't actually have a cosecant button, I throw in a little minus one, and I get the same answer. And let me do it one more time. You could have also used tan. So tan inverse would have been of root 105 over 4. Same answer. Or, and I guess, again, what purpose is there to use cotan? There really isn't one. You know, like, if you can use tan, you can use cotan. But I mean, if you really had to, if you inverse tanned, and then the cotan one was supposed to be 4 root 105 divided by 105. But because I wasn't actually using a, like, since there is no cotan button, and I'm using tan, I gotta use that little minus 1 button. And I get the same answer. That makes sense at all? Now let's say this was a real world problem. Would you actually solve it six times? 
you just do it once and be like, we're good. Does that make sense? But the, the point behind this is that there, there actually are six ways of solving any single triangle. You could use sine, cosine, or tan, which is what you used in, used in junior high, or you could use all the flipping ones. We call them reciprocals. It's not better, it's just it's another way. Does that make sense? Oh, okay, um, let me show you a place where we can use that then in questions I'm going to ask you to solve. And it goes back to being on like a coordinate grid. Uh, do you guys remember the term standard position from earlier this unit? Standard position means that like it has to have one arm on the circle here at zero degrees. And then, pardon me, then you put like a, um, you put a triangle somewhere on the grid. But usually like we, we try to put like the, the point of the triangle right at zero, zero. If I told you that this side right here was 11 and this side was 4, what did we say the other side was? It was root 105? What is that as a decimal? I know I don't normally want decimals, but could someone make that a decimal for me real quick? Just give me one decimal, please. Probably 10.1, right? 10.2? That was close. Okay. If I plotted this triangle on like an xy graph, would it make sense that this point right here was located at 10.2 comma 4. Because this distance right here is the x value. This distance right here is the y value. Oh, yeah. And so uh, this is a point 0.2, by the way. 10.2 is your x value all the way over. And 4 is your y value. And so if you ever know like an x and a y value, you can actually plot a triangle on a circle. Sense? So let me try an example here. Uh, I'm actually just going to hop right into here's an example. Mm -hmm. Sorry, jump ahead in your notes, find the example, and I'll come back to the stuff I skipped. This is a very typical question I'm going to ask you on like a quiz or an assignment. It's actually the first question on your assignment. I'm going to say the point P36 lies on the terminal arm of an angle in standard position. So my first question is, let's plot point P on a coordinate grid. Where does 3, 6 go? Well, over 3, up 6 would be right about here. Can I make a triangle out of this? It would look like this. It would go straight from here down to the origin. Then it would go over 3. And it would go up 6. Does that make sense so far? This distance down here would be 3. This distance up here would be 6. What's the hypotenuse going to be? Could we find it? OK, so let's figure out the hypotenuse. The hypotenuse would be 3 squared plus 6 squared, square rooted. So that'll be 9 plus 64. Well, let's leave it as an exact value, though, unless I say otherwise. So is that root 73? Is that right? Root 73 goes right there. What? Did I do that right? Yeah. No, I did not. 6 squared is not 64. I'm sorry, guys. I, I goofed. 6 squared is not 64. My bad. Ignore me. 6 squared is 36, which makes this 45. Sorry, guys. Even I make mistakes. Should I write it as root 45, though? You can actually simplify root 45. Does root 45 divide by a perfect square number? And it does. 9 goes into 45. So you could write root 45 as 9 times 5. Why do I pick 9, though? Yeah, so this thing is best written as 3 root 5. So then let's write that as this side over here, 3 root 5. Does that make sense so far? So I plotted the point 3, 6. It means my bottom value right here is 3. My opposite value here is 6. And I used Pythagoras' theorem to find the actual hypotenuse. Now my question is, can we determine the exact values of the primary trig ratios? So. 
What's one of the trig ratios you learned back in like junior high days? Sine. Sure, sine. All right. Well, sine is supposed to be equal to opposite over hypotenuse. Opposite of what? Where is the angle? This little guy right here. The example I did on the other one, I kind of did it wrong on purpose, but this is where the reference angle goes in this little corner here. If it's in other quadrants, like for example, if I do something in this quadrant, the reference angle is this little guy right here. It's like the stuff we were working on the last couple of days. Sure, that, that's, that's what we're going for. Yeah, the angle that's closest to the actual vertex zero, zero point. So sine of theta then compared to this guy would be opposite <coughs> over hypotenuse. Couple of thoughts here. Is this simplified? No, no. Six and three, they can actually divide by each other. You have a root on the bottom. But you also have a root on the bottom. So hopefully you're getting a little faster at fixing that. It just does this. Whoops, not a root on the bottom. Two root five over five. There, that's what sine should be equal to. I'm gonna skip ahead to part D, just because I'm here. Part D says determine the value of theta. I now could actually inverse sign this thing and find theta. So let's try it. Let's inverse sign, inverse sign to root five over five. That angle in there is about 63 point four degrees. That looks about right, doesn't it? Is that the only way to prove that, that angle is 63 degrees though? Let's try another one of my grade eight Sokotoa things. Because yeah, there's actually five ways you could do this. Let's try cosine. What's cosine usually equal to? Okay, so your adjacent is three. Your hypotenuse is three root five. Okay, now that's not written properly yet though. Same issue, do three and three actually cancel each other? And then root five can't actually be on the bottom. So cancel the threes, you end up with one over root five. So then this is actually root five over five. Let's try it. Inverse cosine root five over five. Same answer. One more time. We could also have done tan. So what would tan be equal to? <coughs> tan is opposite over adjacent. Opposite was 6. Adjacent was 3. Those simplify. Yeah, there we go. Probably the easiest one of all three to do would be just the inverse tanning of 2. And ta-da! Same thing. Does that make sense? Uh, that, by the way, is actually grade 11 curriculum. Okay. This next step is grade 12 curriculum. Okay. If I ask you for the reciprocal trig ratios, all I'm asking you to do is flip the stupid fraction upside down. Okay. So sine goes with cosecant. So take your fraction and flip it upside down. Uh, you know what, though? I'm not going to take this fraction right here and flip it upside down. Because if I flip this guy upside down, I'm going to get a square root on the bottom. So I'm going to take this fraction right here that used to have the square root on the bottom, and I'm just going to flip it upside down. So I'm going to go with root 5 over 2. Just take this guy right here and flip it upside down. It's actually a lot simpler. And cosine is a secant. So I could flip root 5 over 5 upside down, but then I'm going to get the, fraction, the square root on the bottom again. So I'm going to flip this guy upside down which would have been 3 root 5 over 3, which is just root 5, because the 3's we're going to cancel. And then the last one, a cotan, is uh, whatever this was before I flip it, which would be 3 over 6, which when I reduce it would be a half. Does that make sense? This is grade 12 curriculum. 
It's not actually that hard. I just, does that make sense why I'm doing this? My thought process, next year, when I've got to teach you sine, cosine, and cotan, I don't have to spend as long. And it doesn't really take that much more brain space, I don't imagine, for you. If you wanted to prove this, by the way, you still could. Your calculator does not have a cosine or cosecant or cotan button. So here's what you'd do. You would inverse, say, like 10. But you can't actually type this guy in. So you're going to type in like 0.5, because that's a half. You'll throw a little negative 1 on the end of it. And it'll give you the same number. I'll just do one more here. You can't type in secant, but you can type in cosine. Oh, I need to inverse cosine it. Then I'm going to do root 5. But then since it wasn't actually cosine, it was secant, then I just throw a little minus 1 on there. And again, I get the same stinking angle in the corner. That makes sense. Cool. Okay, go take five in a break. Just five though, please, okay? When you come back, I'll finish off what I haven't covered so far. You guys <laughs> seem to be getting this, so that's good. I don't see a lot of weird looks on your faces. Maybe, I don't know. Gas <laughs> money. <laughs> more fudge or not more fudge? That is a hard question. I'm going to have some more. Really? Is it good? Yeah. yeah. It's like no, it like. I took it out of the fridge at 7 this morning and it's now like almost 3. So it's been like un unchilled for a long time. Did you scoot the foil? I did that. I'll agree with that then. Yeah, I mean, if you find it silly to try to do like the same thing six times, it's not actually purposeful. It, like, you're just canceling very cyclical, though, anyway. Basically. Yeah, that's what, you, that is what you're doing. You're, you're just, you're making your reciprocal, canceling it, and then finding your angle. So that's one of the reasons why it really wasn't that purposeful to show it in grade seven, eight, nine. Like, how does it actually help? But it's totally something that, like, you use, you use these sorts of things when you go on in calculus a lot. To be honest, I don't actually know enough about how to use secants and tens in. You know. Are we going to start this time? What was that? Are we going to start this time? Oh, you guys should be able to start a couple of questions. Yeah. Okay. Let me keep going from here. Let me skip those. Let me go back to those slides I skipped. Then. Okay. Let me go over some notes on what we did. Here are three notes about standard position. First thing, rather than using vertices of the triangle, um, we'd rather label them not as like say A, B, and C. You know how we do like Pythagoras' theorem? We want to kind of change things a bit. Rather than A, B, C, we actually want to label based on X and Y. Does that make sense at all? So I don't actually, I'm not actually going to tell you what the three sides of the triangle are. I'm just going to give you a coordinate point. And then if you want to find those points, then A is really X, and B is really Y. And to find C, you'd have to use Pythagoras' theorem. That makes sense? So that's one change. Second change, the angle in question is always the angle at the origin. So it's always this little guy right here. Okay. And then third change, you know how we sometimes use opposite, adjacent, hypotenuse? Well, we can also change those labels. This side is now X. This side is now y, and the hypotenuse we go with for r. Anyone want to hazard a guess as to what r stands for? Not quite. Close. Radius. Radius, actually. Yes, you're right. It's radius. And the reason why is that really what's happening is angles are going around in a circle. And therefore, if things are going around in a circle, you have radiuses. So from now on, when we label triangles, we label them as x, y, and r. r for usually radius. I guess resultant probably works too. Like if you see resultant somewhere, I'm sure it's not wrong. But that's what I learned it does, radius. I hope this diagram kind of makes sense. You see how it's like inside a circle? So hence inside a circle means a radius. So. Okay. Now, what I want to start working on now is what happens if the angle in question is more than 90 degrees? For example, what happens if the angle was this big obtuse angle right here? Uh, how big about do you think that angle is? 150. Sure. 
Uh, it's more than 90. It's less than 180, so 100 and something degrees. Okay. How do we possibly plot stuff based on this? Well, this is where that reference angle idea comes in. Rather than trying to plot a triangle that goes all the way across over here, that has no right angles in it, that's not helpful whatsoever. We plot a triangle right here. And the angle we look for is this guy right here. Let's say I find that angle and it's 30. Hypothetically, let's say that angle is 30. That's called the reference angle. I'm just going to use RA as an abbreviation here. If the reference angle here is 30, then the actual standard position angle would be 150. So sometimes we draw triangles in other quadrants. Reference angle, standard position angle. <laughs> so let me try a different example here. What if I were to give you a point negative 2, 7? This is in a different location now. Where is it located? You guys remember quadrants? Here's quadrant 1, here's quadrant 2, here's quadrant 3, here's quadrant 4. So if I plot negative 2, 7, that's way up uh, here. And if I were to try to draw this angle, the standard position angle looks like it's you know, 100 something degrees maybe. Like it's just barely more than 90, right? So like if I were to, if I were to estimate the angle, uh, I would guess probably about 100 degrees. That would be my guess. Here's how we'd find it though. Don't draw the triangle across here, at least right now. Why is that not useful right now? There's no right angle. Does that make sense? Uh, tomorrow, I'm actually going to show you how to solve it when you don't have a right angle. You can actually use something called the cosine law. But for right now, it's easier just to draw a reference triangle. Yeah, I know. I kind of told you guys that in physics a long time ago. So, um, let's say I was plotting this guy right here at negative 2, 7. This side right here would be backwards by 2. This side right here would be going up by 7. Find me the hypotenuse. Only we're not going to call it a hypotenuse. We're now going to call it a radius. radius. Yeah. So find me the radius. What would that be? Well, you'd have negative 2 squared, which would just be 4. You'd have 7 squared, which would be 49. So when you add them together, root 53. Um, 53 is not divisible by 4 or 9 or 16. It's probably good the way it is, though. Does that make sense? Okay, well, let's do the exact same thing we did last time. It's kind of redundant, but just to make sure we're clear, then what would sine of theta be? Well, it would be opposite over hypotenuse. So that would be 7 over root 53. Only we can't write it like that. So it's going to be 7 root 53 over 53. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, cosine. This one's the first one where it gets kind of weird. Cosine actually gives you a negative as the adjacent. Include the negative. So go negative 2 over root 53. So because it's in the backwards quadrant, actually count the negative. So then cosine of theta would actually be equal to negative 2 root 53 over 53. And then tan would be opposite over adjacent. So that's uh, 7 over negative 2. Tan's always the easiest one, by the way. Because like tan never has square roots in it. You know what I mean? Because like it's the one that didn't have to use Pythagoras. So those are our, this guy right here this one and this one these are our primary ratios if i ask you to find the reciprocal ratios just flip them so then cosecant of theta would be root 53 over 7 secant of theta would be root 53 over negative 2 and cotan would be equal to negative 2 over 7 ta da Alright, last question then. Find me theta. 
You could find theta one of six ways. <laughs> sure, let's go with 10. Uh, if you were to inverse 10, negative 7 over 2? Okay, so it shouldn't make a difference, but let me just do that then. Inverse 10, 7 over negative 2. So long as one of them is negative, that's all that matters. You get an angle that's negative. Okay, this is one of the most complicated parts of trigonometry that kids in my 30-1 class struggle with. What we asked our calculator to do is find me where tan was a negative number. And tan was able to be a negative number in this quadrant right here. But it's also possible that tan could have been a negative number in a quadrant like this, where the negative sign was actually the 7, and this guy was 2. This would still give you a tan of a negative 7 over 2, or does that make sense? Like how you can have the negative on either the 2 or the 7? What your calculator figured out is that the closest angle it could find was by going backwards by 74 degrees. So it was just 74. That's the thing, yeah. Because your calculator is fit on a negative, that doesn't actually impact anything. It just means that this angle right here is 74 degrees. So you kind of have to use a little bit of discretion here and recognize that what your calculator did is it found the closest angle it could. And the closest way it could find a negative 2 and 7 combo, it tried to find something in this quadrant here, which is not what we were looking for whatsoever. But that 74 is what's actually in the corner here. Here's the problem, though. Is 74 actually the answer we want? No, we want 108 Yeah, we want 108 minus this answer. You have a question there? Uh, we'll never encounter a negative angle. Mm, not, in this, not, not this year. Next year, yes. It happens all the time next year, but I'm going to try to keep away from negative angles here. So can we just ignore that? Yeah, so but long story short, ignore the negative. Okay? Yeah. So if this guy right here is 74 degrees, then what's the actual standard position angle? Um, well, 180 minus 74 should be about 106. Sure, let's, let's go to the nearest one. I said it was about 100. 106 isn't bad. Now, I want to try something here. I want to check my work. Let's say, now which one did we use? We used tan, right? Okay. What if I were to do sine of 106? Oh, okay. The 106? Yeah. If this little guy here is 74, then the way around to it must be 106. Did they ask uh, That's part D, determine the value of theta. But the theta is not the little theta in the corner. Oh. It's the all the way around angle. Does that make sense? Well, yeah. Like, what did you do in that? Like I took 108, or 180, and I minus 74, because 180 is over here. 74 is that little guy in there. And that gives me 106. Oh. Okay, Here, here's the point I was hoping to make after that. You can actually check your work to some degree. Um, take sine of 106. We also said that sine was supposed to be 7 root 53 over 53. If I were to do 7 root 53 over 53, now I did round a little bit, so I expect these will be slightly out. But would you agree that these numbers are pretty darn close to one another? They're slightly up. Let me try it with cosine. Cosine of 106 is this number here. Note the negative. Over here I said cosine was supposed to be negative 2 root 53 over 53. Again, they're slightly different, but that's because I rounded. That makes sense. So that actually kind of explains why this guy's a negative. It's negative because it's backwards in this quadrant. You guys want to try one by yourselves? <laughs> that was rhetorical. Try one by yourselves. <laughs> Let me give you like a five minute head start just to see whether you can do it. I mean, I'll, I'll do it with you, but sometimes I say in math, you have to transition between like, I can watch somebody do it, to, I know I've seen you do it, can I actually do it myself? And then the next step is, can I do it by, by myself without any help whatsoever? That's a test. 
Yeah, that's a test. And then the hard part of the test is, can I do something I've never seen before in my life by myself? And that's a diploma. <laughs> so we have to eventually work our way to that. Where it's like, I don't even know what the test is on. You should say you. They're hard. They're very hard. I don't want to scare you guys, but statistically, like one out of every four kids fails their diploma exam in math and science. At least. No, a quarter of the class. Sorry, a quarter of the class, and I'm gonna fail. By definition, a quarter. Like they're hard. I, it sucks. I do my best to try to help kids do well on them, but like they are hard. So, anyways, we've got time before that though. I know. It's like, oh yeah, no, it's you got this. They're hard. Well, that's the thing is, diplomas are hard because they're worth a lot of your percentage. I don't write the test. I don't mark the test. It's on curriculum, yes, but they always put questions on there that you've never seen before. If that makes sense. So, like, not only do you have to do the test by yourself without any help whatsoever and do it perfectly, but for sure they're going to throw on things that you've never seen before in your life. Which is frustrating because it's like, how do you prepare for like the unknown? <laughs> so we do our best. Where do we keep these tests? <laughs> <laughs> that's why people cheat. Yeah. Well, don't do that because that means you'll never get to go to like university or college. Or you get caught, you're pretty much out for life. So. Like, there's answers literally sitting Probably, but it's probably in Edmonton, like where the <laughs> government of Alberta stuff is. <laughs> we don't, we don't need to cheat. Like, I don't want to toot my own horn, but like, my kids usually do very well. Still. So, like, please don't be afraid of failure. Like, normally, like, although the failure rate across the province is like one in four, usually I only have like maybe five, ten percent of kids fail. Which I mean, still, to me, is still a failure because I don't want anyone to fail. But, yeah, we can probably do it again. You can do your diploma again. Sit how many tests do you get? Oh, as many as you want to pay for. Hey. Well, how much are they? It's about 20 bucks to renew a diploma. 20 bucks? Yeah, it's pretty cheap. <laughs> oh, awesome. Yeah. But that was something you got left afterwards. Uh, they actually always give you the higher failure. Oh, really? So if you fail your diploma, do you have to come back next year, right? Or can well, it depends on the course, all? right? Like if it's math, you might not need to do better on it, right? Because maybe you fail math, but like you still graduate. English and social are where it's really tricky because like if you fail your English diploma and like you fail it by enough that your English mark goes below 50, then you won't get your diploma. Does that make sense? So that's why like when, like I'll talk for her, when Miss Mack or Miss ACM talks about how like you have to have a good mark in social 30 or English 30, she's not lying because like lots of kids fail their diplomas. And like if you go into the diploma with say like a 60 and then you get like say 42, the average of the two will still mean you pass. But like if you go into the diploma with like a 52 and you get a 42, well then you fail and you don't graduate. So like. Well, with math, it's like you only, you only need like a 20. Well, you don't. You only need a 20 level math to graduate. So like so if people fail their math diplomas, it's not usually the end of the world. Wait, you only need what? Well, you need social and math to gra You need social and English to graduate at grade 12 level, but you don't actually have to pass a grade 12 level math or science course to. To graduate. You need a grade 11 science course for graduation requirements, but not grade 12. Yeah. Technically, you could just go through high school taking social studies and like. Don't you need to have a grade 11 math and science thing? Yeah, yeah. Like you need but grade Oh, in grade 12. Yeah, in grade 12, you technically only need to take two courses, really. Is that why, like, I never see the terms in yeah, because many of them just only do the bare minimum, right? And then some of them are every class, right? Because, like, take Raj and Carlin, they're in, like, all sorts of classes, right? But, like, some of them only take two or one. That's going to be us. I don't know. It's scary. Have you guys had enough time to try it? No. Or was I too distracting by talking? <laughs> I was distracting. I'm sorry. That teacher. Okay, so this is like, that's what yes. That'll work. Well, equals negative for a negative. Okay, so the negative. Hang on a second. Isn't the negative. This is the. This is the. This is the adjacent. You're going to find my hotline. You haven't actually found my hotline right now. Because sine is opposite. Hotline. And you're doing 10. You're doing opposite over adjacent. Sorry. I wasn't here for the first two, and I. Thank you.
Um, this will be adjacent. Like this will be opposite. What? And then this will be your radius. So this will be adjacent to the next to your angle. This will be opposite across from your angle. Yeah, I got some I got a picture down here. I think I Y and R. Adjacent? I did it. Opposite. Yeah. Does three divide by I don't think so. It's pretty rare that it actually does. But you should always just keep a lookout for it, because if it does actually reduce it's it nice because it makes it simpler. My wife made um my wife made um fudge for my grade twelve class. And um, it's been sitting out for like three days. No, <laughs> I, I left. I left this morning at seven, so it's been out for like uh, eight hours, nine hours. <laughs> so it started to melt. Yeah, it's actually okay. Like it's actually tastes like. But like it basically seems like it's yeah, just it's like a chocolate peanut butter mix of like mushy. <laughs> yeah. Like it looked good when it wasn't all melted. If you'd like to have some, you can. Yeah. yeah, people say it actually does taste good. I didn't think like that. <laughs> 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 you can't even have a piece. I hit a glove. <laughs> My, uh... Oh, yeah, let's give this one a try. Make sure you guys are on the right idea here. Has everyone tried? It's like 90, 180, and then 270 down here. So you subtract, like, your angle from 270? Well, your angle is actually needing to get added to 90. To 180. Because that's where reference angles go. Can I just try this one? I'm giving you guys at least a second to give it a try. When you plot this guy at negative 3, negative 8, it'll be way down here. Where did you draw your triangle though? Did you draw it like this? Okay, that's not correct though. Because a, you always have to draw it to the origin and the angle has to be in here for this to work. So when you well, then, when you want to find your whole angle all the way around to here, you're going to go 180 plus that little guy in the corner there. Can I just, can I keep going? So, let me plot some signs here. This side will be negative 3. This side will be negative 8. And it is actually very important that we plot those negatives. It actually does make a difference. Um, the hypotenuse, just so you guys know, the hypotenuse is by definition always made a positive number. So even if it's like got other negative numbers nearby, we're always going to make this be a positive number. And to find that, it'll be negative 3 squared, negative 8 squared, square rooted. So 9 plus 64. This is that root 73 I was trying to do earlier, isn't it? So far, so good. Okay, so we've done A. We've plotted the point P on a coordinate grid. Part B, determine the sine, cosine, and tan values. So sine of theta will be opposite over hypotenuse, which means you have negative 8 root 73 over 73. Cosine will be adjacent over hypotenuse. That's a 73. So that'll be negative 3 root 73 over 73. Uh, sine. sine is opposite over hypotenuse. So this guy's opposite, and that guy's hypotenuse. This is your angle right in here. So then this side is opposite, and that side's hypotenuse. Okay. Uh, lastly, you need tan of theta, and tan is opposite over adjacent. By the way, if you have two negative numbers, do you really need to write them with both negatives anymore? I thought it was a regular. Well, it's got to be negative 8 based on what I told you there. So you're up in the wrong quadrant then. <laughs> That'll make a huge difference though because my answer is going to be like 250 degrees, whereas your answer would have been like 100 and something degrees. So you'd be off by a considerable amount. All because of one negative sign though. So, Okay, let's find that angle. I'm going to skip ahead here. The easiest one to find the angle with is probably tan. So let me go second tan. Come on. Second tan, the 8 over 3. 
and it gives me about 69 degrees in the corner here. What is the actual angle I'm looking for though? Well, it's 180 plus 69, so the answer is 249 degrees. Yep. Let me just check my work. Let me type in the cosine of 249 degrees and see whether this is almost the same as negative 3 root 73 divided by 73. So let's see whether this as a number right here is the same thing. Let me just do one more then. Let's do sine of 249 and see whether that is the same as negative 8 root 73 divided by 73. And they're pretty darn close. They're off only because I rounded. Because it wasn't actually 249, it was like 249 point something. Okay, so way back here I said that cosine was supposed to be equal to negative 3 root 73 over 73. So what I did here is I found that as a decimal number and found what decimal number it is. Okay. Well, it said that cosine of theta was supposed to be equal to that, but I actually know what theta is. Theta is 249. So if I type in sine of 249, so like if, if, I, if I type in like sine of 249 and find it as a decimal number, this as a decimal number should be the same thing as this is a decimal number. Oh, okay. So the 249 was that I got a 69 in here and then I added it to 180 because I have to go all the way around the circle to get there. Okay. Uh, one last thing here. We also could do the reciprocal ones. And so here are those real quick. Cotan would be equal to 3 over 8. Secant would be equal to root 73 over negative 3. And cosecant would be equal to root 73 over negative 8. Did you guys have to look at that on your own? Yeah. No. You just need more time, huh? Yeah. Okay. Okay, good. I'm glad. Okay, um, here I've just got pictures of what things would look like in all four quadrants, because you could actually have a point in quadrant one, two, three, or four. The biggest difference is where the negative signs go. And you have to make sure you get the angle right, because like when I was talking to Sean there, if he puts this in the wrong quadrant, he's going to get an angle of like 100 something degrees, whereas my angle was 200 something degrees. Well, imagine that this was important somewhere, like imagine you were an air traffic controller and you told a plane to head on a bearing of 105 degrees, but you actually should have told them to go on a bearing of 245 degrees. They're going the wrong way. And not just by a little bit, <laughs> by a lot. So the negative does make a difference. Okay, let me try a completely different type of example here. I want you to find me the exact value of cosecant of 240. On which one? The last one? It was 249. Because it was 69 plus 180. Whereabouts is 240 degrees? It's in this quadrant here. What would the reference angle be? Like, what is this angle right here if all the way around is 240? 60. Right? Because if this guy is 180 and this guy right here is 240, the angle between them must be 60 degrees. Does that make sense? Well, no, we're not done yet. Okay. Now, if this guy is 60 degrees, and I use the words exact value, I showed you guys a couple classes ago an exact value triangle for 60 degrees that involves, uh, let's see, this guy's 30 then, this guy's 90. This side would be a 1, this side is a 2, and this side is a root 3. Do you guys remember those triangles from a few days back? Um, so let me just change this up a little bit here. If it's a, if it's a 60... 60, 60 triangle, and all the sides are 2, and then you rip it in half, it means that now this, uh, this is now a 30, this side here is now a 1, because like this whole half is gone, and then if this side is 1 and this side is 2, by Pythagoras' theorem this side is root 3. 
And so that's what I basically plotted on the triangle here. I have another problem here, though. If this side is root 3 and this side is 1, though, shouldn't they be going backwards? So this side should be negative root 3. And this side should be negative 1. Well, the, well, the 2 is the hypotenuse, and the 2 is always a positive number, just so you know. But these guys are negative because they're in like, like this point right here would be negative root 3 comma negative 1. That's where this point would be. Okay, now let me actually solve the question then. I wanted you to tell me what the cosecant was. Cosecant is the hypotenuse over the opposite. What's my hypotenuse? What's my opposite? Um, negative 1. So this should be equal to basically negative 2. Now, I really can't check my work in my calculator. Because does your calculator have a cosecant button? OK, now here's the difference, though. The negative 1 goes in a different spot this time. Okay. I can't type in cosecant, but I can type in sine of 240. But this time, because I know the angle, I don't reciprocal the angle. I close this thing off, and I reciprocal when I'm done. That makes sense? So because I know the angle, the, actually the reciprocal sign goes afterwards. Somehow that didn't work. I thought, I thought it was the, um, you put the 60 in there, and then you times it by it. I should have been able to do it by 240. Why did that not work? Sine of 240. 40, double bracket, maybe I need some another bracket. Maybe I have the one and the two in the wrong spot. Ah, I made a mistake. This triangle right here, I have my, my numbers in the wrong spots here. The 30 goes across from the 1, the 2 goes across from the 90, and the 60 goes across from the root 3. I have these guys in the wrong spot. I'm sorry. This root 3 and this 1, they're in the wrong spots. I drew my triangle wrong. This side right here should have been the 1, because 1 goes next to 60, and root 3 goes next to 30. That's actually how I try to remember it. I guess I screwed up. The 3 and the 30 go next to each other. So, Okay, so it means this point was actually negative 1, negative root 3, which means that I screwed this guy up. This guy was actually supposed to be 2 over negative root 3. Let me test that. If I do 2 divided by negative root 3, there we go. Now it's the same answer. Okay, so let me change that up then. If we have 2 over negative root 3 times by root 3 over root 3, you'd get 2 root 3 over negative 3. 2 root 3 over negative 3. That's it, which is the same thing as sine of 240. I can't actually do a cosecant, but if I do the little negative 1 thing afterwards, that's how this guy works. Yeah. That makes sense? Cool. I just have one example left, right? Which I should, because I'm, it should be the same thing. Like, the 2 over negative root 3 should be the same as the 2 root 3 over negative 3. Should no, be the same as... As what you had before. Yeah. Like, way before. You said it was wrong. Yeah, I, I screwed up my triangle. My triangle was what was in the wrong spot. Because I thought it was going to equal negative 2, but it wasn't supposed to equal negative 2. The negative 1 and the 3 Yeah, those were in the wrong spots. 2 was okay. All right, let me try one last example, then we'll call it a day. That is the same number as 2 root 3 over negative 3 as an actual decimal number. And what it tells you is the length of the hypotenuse compared to the length of the opposite, how they relate to each other. So really, the hypotenuse is 1.15 times longer than the adjacent. Right. One last question. I want you to tell me two different angles that would make cosine of theta equal to negative root 3 over 2. 
What is cosine equal to? Well, it's normally equal to adjacent over hypotenuse. Let me try plotting a triangle right here. Let's make the adjacent negative root 3 and the hypotenuse 2. Does that make sense to put it in a quadrant like that? How can this guy here be negative? Though? It's not in the right spot. Maybe it needs to go in this quadrant. Here could I have a negative root 3, a 2, and a 1. Would that be a logical place to somehow have a negative adjacent and a hypotenuse? What was that? Well, no, because this one is going up still. So but there angle. is another possibility, though. The other location, because here I said there's two angles. You also could draw this down here, where you could have a negative one, a negative root three, and a two. The fact that the one was positive or negative doesn't actually affect a cosine, though. So then does that mean that angle is 30? Yeah, now I need to use that angle right. And I just said the 30 degrees goes next to the root three. So what are the two angles? Well, all the way around to here, one of the angles is 150. What's the other angle? Well, let's see. From all the way around here is 150, like this. If I kept going down into this quadrant, 180 plus 30? Good, 210. Let me check my work. Um, but we wanted cosine though, not sine. You're right though. You're right. Let me test this. First I'm going to find what cosine of 150 is. That number. And then I'm going to find the cosine of 210. Same number. And then I'm going to actually find out what negative root 3 over 2 is. And it should be the same number. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. Oh, wait, thanks for bearing with me for a really long lesson, guys. Um, you guys can pack up. Just, just hang out till the bell, okay? That was definitely a long, long lesson.